but all come across times when you know we've had that, we've experienced that grey area ourselves. Is it something that officers do, or is it something that councillors should do, or should you take the lead on if you're a CEO and the uh, and the mayor doesn't want to comment on a bad story? Often the CEO will comment. Therefore, who in the eyes of the community is actually the mayor? Is the mayor is the CEO? These are the perceptions that are often built up around within our communities. Over to you guys to ask any questions of any of the panellists in relation to who is actually in control. Down the back here. And uh, I've been a council for 12 years, I don't think I've ever been asked to contribute to a media release. And uh, sometimes the mayor can't be across every, every issue. And so it, I think it's a good way to actually harness the whole resources of that team to actually use individual councillors more from certain portfolios. So, and it just helps people all get on board, be trained, or get that experience. And I was just interested to see if any other councils, councils actually use that model. Or am I just sort of thinking it's an ideal model? Because I do think it would be a really great way of um, utilising all your resources. Not everybody wants to be there or has the time to do it, uh, but people can have a lot of experience in certain areas and they can have uh, a lot of credibility about certain subjects when they, they are asked to comment on their, their name is used and their comments are comments, uh, sought. Thank you. Thank you. Jill Evans, Community Services Director, Golden Plains, you're tied up in the administration there. Is there a crossover between who comments publicly? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. I think generally our understanding is it's the mayor and the CEO who would comment. Our mayor certainly would be more likely to. When it comes to community planning, we would be very much encouraging of, of the, not officers, but certainly the community to have a say around that because I guess that where I sit, and I can only talk about Golden Plains Shire Council and the role that community planning plays, is that it probably adds somewhat to the confusion that when we're talking about moral clarity. But I think it is a great opportunity for people to, both councillors, officers and the community, to at least have an opportunity to have a, a discussion. Because we're not talking about the council plan. We're not talking about the CEO's contract. We're talking about communities being very clear with both officers and councillors about what they see are their priorities. And there's so much ownership in that. And it informs our council plan, it informs our budget, it informs our officers, not just community service officers, I'd like to say, because we have, uh, we have our planners are involved in our community planning. They, they will be there to attend meetings if the community request. So I think ours is almost a little bit uh, as, as, uh, as we've just talked about, that it's, it is a little bit about a practice. It's about trying out some of these things. And I, I guess I'm a person who is very strongly of the view that um, I am a Hollywood supporter, but I actually love grey. I don't always go for black and white. My God. And, 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 uh, so I do like the grey. And I, I actually see the it's relationship with councillors, officers in the community almost blossom in that grey space. Yes, take a look on your face, Dan. Anyone want to support a jewel? No more questions for you? Here, here. That's fine. That's okay. I'm John McClendon. And, uh, John, how do you deal with councillors when things don't go as planned? And uh, we've got plenty of examples of that, I guess, over the years, haven't we? Where, uh, I guess, councillors might speak out about a motion or about uh, an issue that council picked up on and has been voted in a council chamber. I guess we sometimes get confused in terms of supporting the community and actually that role between a council decision and what the community actually uh, perceive or want. Okay, thank, thank you, James. Uh, what do we do when things go wrong? Mark, uh, Mark pointed out that the uh, Act isn't particularly helpful in uh, clarifying uh, the difference in roles, but I think you can have policy that does that, and we shouldn't underestimate the importance of media. Uh, it's different in different parts of Victoria and different councils. If you're in a municipality that is servicing a daily media cycle, the role of the media is so much more important. If you're in a council that has uh, perhaps a weekly, the 
but no one buys actually because there's not much news in it, particularly during summer when the, the footy's not on. Uh, councils like mine actually make their own press and put out their own uh, publications to the community. It's essential that you reinforce who's in charge and the Mayor is in charge in the public eye, particularly when you're talking about policy. Um, if I pose a, a question, Gavin, and I don't want an answer because it might go wrong if I get an answer, but uh, in the days that Simon Overland was the Chief Commissioner of Police, how long will it take you to remember who was the Minister? Something went wrong there, in, this is a personal view now, something went wrong there where the Minister of the Day was busy, he was in the background, he was actually the member for Bendigo West, he was busy running the show, he was in the background, and Simon took the initiative and became the, the, uh, the poster boy. Mm -hmm. And where's he now? Woe betide a CEO that would find himself in that position. Mm -hmm. The mayor's in charge. Mm -hmm. Would not have any love in the Would not have any. Mm -hmm. no, uh, very good, very good. Mark Hayes, what about when things go wrong? Well, I, I posed a question to you that I reckon people know that things are going to go wrong, and I reckon that there's no real safety net or no real net to catch people who don't execute good relationships, who don't do things in the betterment of the, of the collective, who don't have a good will. And I put it to you that they know that they can get away with it, and they do. And I guess really, I think in the Local Government Act, there was, uh, before the Local Government Act review in the early, two th in the early uh, 2000s, there was uh, a, a number of people, well, a particular council, used to cause a by-election to demonstrate to the rest of the councils that he had a mandate and he'd keep getting re-elected. Um, I pose the question to you that there is no real solid um, measure, if you like, to really make recalcitrant councils sit up and take notice and to really get in there and stop marginalising yourself and to work with the collective and to have the gumption to understand that sometimes you're not in the majority, you're in the minority, but you've still got the intestinal fortitude to get on with it. What's your response? Uh, I agree entirely, and that's part of the debate that has got to be had as part of this review of council conduct. Because um, back in 2008, when the Act was amended and um, some great <coughs> teeth were introduced into the Local Government Act around council conduct and um, sanctions for misconduct. I think it was the hope of many that the system that was being set up would have just the effect that those who did it step out of line in whatever way could in a sense be built it back into line uh, through council of conduct panels. The system has not worked well at all. Uh, and you know, there are philosophical uh, debates to be had about whether the Minister ought to be given the power to swoop in and suspend an individual uh, councillor who um, isn't prepared to work uh, as part of the team, uh, or whether if you see the state government in some role in relation to elected officials, you know, why don't you go to the same thing in relation to officers? So it's not an easy question to answer, but I agree entirely the system has not worked. It's not working. And councillors who are intent on causing difficulty, and I make you know, the observation that they are in a minority in Victoria, by huge numbers, they are in a minority, but they exist in some places. The difficulties that they can cause are massive, the dysfunction can be um, considerable, and yet the system doesn't really have a means of addressing it. Thanks, Mama. And it does. Sorry, can I, get, hold on, can I just say? Yes. No, no, no. I, that, I disagree with the Bundestag and approach. Um, there will be dissent, dissent. We live in a pluralist society. We live in a pl pluralist community. This isn't, this isn't Syria, where you, you, you get gassed for your trouble. Um, here, you can actually say something. You can disagree, support it, but uh, insofar as, well, I can't do anything about it, but I disagree with what's being said. No, I, don't think I, I, I don't think anybody would respect his suggestion that people should be able to do that. The point that Gavin was making is that there were people who go way beyond that. Uh, having put their view very vociferously, they then do everything that they can to undermine the decision that has been. So now we're talking about boundary violation. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And that's where I say the system 
you have failed. Mm. Nobody, I Agreed. think, would properly contend that councillors who have a variety of different views shouldn't be able to express those views and express them strongly. That's to be expected mm. of them. But it's when it goes much further than that and there's this active undermining of the council decision that things become paralysed and yet there's no added means of addressing it. I think that's... Agreed. Um, just listening to the uh, ideas on uh, um, training for councillors and then this code of conduct, do you think there's basically a danger that we're going to create a domain of basically bay solicitors as, um, as our councillors? Uh, um, I, I think we can't take the fun out of it, so um, yeah, for what it's worth, some comment on that. Um, I've been on boards of governments of some sort or another since the early 90s. And over that period of time, there's been tremendous change in the expectations of people who sit on boards, board members and directors, to know more about their role, to know exactly what's required to understand the legislation. It's not at all taken the fun out of it. It's made me a much more skilled and contributing board member. <coughs> Those same rules don't you know, sit over the local government area, but you could say that they're analogous. That the more you understand about your role and where its, its boundaries are, the better you can play in those grey spaces and be creative, actually come up with wonderful solutions and really look to an end product. I think there's so much benefit in knowing more about your role, having an understanding of where those limitations are, and then having fun in those spaces where you can really make a difference. Fantastic. This is for Mark Hayes. <laughs> Don't wiggle out from this. Um, how do you view lawyers on the council? My experience for two, two years has shown that they give to drink a devil's cocktail. <laughs> do you think the lawyers are a bad apple, which I think they are, a bad apple into the cocktail and do you think they should be voted in? Thank you. <laughs> um, I took the question to be about lawyers on the council, that is councillors who have legal qualifications and it would be a gross generalisation I think to say that they're good or uh, they're bad. Uh, what I can say is that I have met plenty of lawyers on councillors who think that they know far more <laughs> after the Local Government Act and uh, the legislation that constrains the Local Government we do and probably even a degree of deference they don't deserve in that respect. Um, but uh, Local Government attracts all tasks, all professions, all industries, all jobs, and that's good here. There's no reason why lawyers can't be as good as any other council of them can have a background. Last night, we were talking about a project um, one of the community members was very passionate about. And um, she was trying to work out how to engage support for it. So we talked about an awareness debate a raising event that we held. And the question was asked how many politicians attended, to which the staff replied three councillors. And she said, no, they don't count. We need people with real power. So, and my surname's power too, so I thought that was doubly <laughs> um, Question for Jan. Um, what, you talked about the wide ranging effect of the community planning that you've been part of in the community was. What was the catalyst for it at Gagari and what can councils do to foster or at least encourage this? Now Jan, just, did you hear that totally in its entirety? Otherwise we can ask, can you just ask that again please? Oh, that's okay. Um, you talked about the wide ranging effects of community planning and I wanted to know what the catalyst was for that starting at Gagari and secondly, what can councils do to foster or at least encourage this? Um, Community planning started 10 years ago in Gagari when Gagari was just about equal dead. And the catalyst was we had a drought function in the local produce store and we expected 100 guys to come along in their young roots instead we got 350. And the realisation from that day was that people had forgotten how to gather. And when we looked around the community we saw the CWA had gone away, the Mothers Club didn't exist, the kindergarten's parent group didn't exist. So people no longer got together to talk about things that were great, talk about things that were bad. And therefore, community planning had just started in Gary, 
And so we looked for an event which would, on a monthly basis, bring our community together. And some guy had a great idea about a farmer's market. Well, you know, that went straight over my head because 192 people weren't going to keep many produce stalls open. That's my blinkered vision. Never understanding that people will travel from Melbourne interstate to come to our market that it is today. And I guess it was, we learnt along the way and we were guided by a wonderful community planner who, in, I guess, inspired us to follow our gut feeling the whole time. This is good. Look what we have done. We've got people together. At the same time, we created a music program that's quite unique for us, Victoria. Not really knowing where we were going, but our community had the guts, if I had to use one word, to give it a go. And we've moved down that track now so that we've had enough successes that I hate to say, but we don't need council anymore as planners or whatever you might call it. We need them to be partners. We're in business to do our own good. Sadly, a lot of things have got in the way of some of the other community plans, people, some of the other groups, and it's, it's slowed things to the point where people have got sick of it and gone away. People have got to have success in community planning, and I guess seeing a community come together, like at, at the music festival we have 100 volunteers. There's 192 people in the area, and 100 volunteers. There's 40 volunteers at our regular monthly market. People are now, some people are slow to come to the table, but because we generate an income stream which services the whole community, it runs the community car, it, it does all the, the uh, maintenance work at the rec reserve, it equips the CFA to be one of the best CFA community groups you could ever imagine. Anybody who comes on board actually determines what they can get out of the community. So as people have develop their own little wealthy income stream, they see the purpose of what we're doing. And I'm mad on events because I see what events can do for communities. And the one thing that Compassity has been very good at doing is it gave us the funds to fund a little group called Talented Tiny Towns, which is a collective of the little groups within Compassity, which we share our skills, we share our knowledge, we share our talents, and slowly, bit by bit, as we've got time, we're developing a system whereby it's a very much a collaborative approach across the community. Um, together we're pretty powerful. Not in organising what council can do, but in organising what's great for our, our own communities. To be able to write out a cheque to do up the car parks at the halls, fabulous feel, instead of waiting five years for the council to do it, and 20,000 letters. It's a wonderful feeling to take responsibility for a lot of the stuff that happens around our community. Um, it took nurturing, but it took those... I think community planning sometimes starts, starts with too many inspiration and stuff that is very difficult to achieve. But starting with these events that gather communities together and become successful is a marvellous way to go about it. Has that answered what you wanted? Thanks, Chair. And in all that, you work, you work collaboratively with the council. Oh, Has there been any adversarial standoffs at all in working with? Has there been a territorial thing where the council has said, "Well, Jan, that's nice, but we'll make decisions based on the wishes of our communities, because we're elected or not." Um, <laughs> you probably don't know me very well, but that wouldn't happen. It's <laughs> 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 effect though, mayor, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin, can I just add? Because I just asked. Sorry, yes. I just asked her, would she ever consider being a councillor? Yes, and the answer is, Jen? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fringe driver. The reason behind that, I'm 70, I'm too old. That's right, exactly. It's not compulsory for you to vote. No, 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 I've got too much to do at home. That's right. No, that's good. Now, um, hi, I'm Councillor Kate Farrell. It's my first term. Good on you, Kate. Thank you very much. I know a lot of you are out here at uh, third or second term. So I'm actually quite new in this um, role, and from what I can learn so far, I really consider that um, training is absolutely essential and really, really paramount in your first year. Um, it's a, a daunting role if you've never been to council before, and I really would love you to enforce that a potential candidate goes and watches council, actually experiences 
reads the code of conduct prior to actually even the voluntary understanding of the council. I mean, I got in, uh, in council, I had $100 budget, I went around to door knocked, like the third highest folks in our area. And I didn't have much money, but I had a passion to help my communities. And I just think that anybody who wants to stand is a democracy and we can stand, but does need to know the role they're getting into. I can see that this can be a, a job, a full-time job. So I'm putting heaps of hours into it. And I would have loved to see the referendum go through. Um, so can you enlighten me, please, on helping those who want to stand in the future and letting them know what, the, what they actually get into? Because it's quite large. <laughs> Thank you. Correct, Jean. Thank you very much. We much to make open it. I know that um, before the council elections, we have a number of um, prospective council candidate sessions, and we do try to tap into people locally to come along and present on life as a councillor. So we'll keep that in mind. I don't know whether any of the panel wish to comment on uh, on that, the findings. Well, yes, please, Susan, you go first. I, I would obviously okay, we've had conversations about this as we've sat around the council table. What happens when councils are first elected is they make incredibly important decisions, almost within the first moments. They're designing their code of conduct, they're looking at their council plan, they're reviewing their first budget, and they're trying to come to grips with all the things that have to happen simultaneously, and that's really quite daunting. I've seen many councils now almost do a first run of the council plan instead of making it, you know, it's a, a picture of what it might be for four years and then by the time people have got more bedded in, they can really make some clear decisions and understand what they're doing. The training um, beforehand, I would hardly endorse and, uh, you, you know, we've had that discussion about what would be ideal. I don't think you can make it compulsory. But it's beyond, I, I love the conversations that go on, I think it's beyond that. It's, it's about where people can actually say, can I go to the MOV and find out, or VLGA, or whoever, and find out a little bit more about what these documents are and what they do. If you are going to a council and you go to a dysfunctional council and sit around and watch them play a game and believe that that is the way it happens, it perpetuates those same sort of people getting on and believing that that's the way governance works. It is not the way governance works. Thank you. Uh, just a point. Yes, just quickly, Gab, just to say, uh, for the new councillor uh, who really doesn't have much of an idea, the best, I think the best advice that they can be given is listen to your general managers, listen to your chief executive officer. Um, you really need to uh, make the jump from being a community advocate to understanding you now are part of a tier of government. And as such, the bureaucrats in that tier of government are there to help you. And the number of times, uh, I, it's, it's almost like an epiphany, watching new councillors realise that, hold on, these guys, they're going to produce my speech notes, they're going to give me a briefing, they're going to sit down and talk about the options in relation to a, a, an idea or a proposal. Uh, so the change for some can be quite remarkable. For others, uh, one particular councillor there, uh, it took her 15 years before she twigged, hold on, these guys are really very helpful to me. So, you know, if nothing else, if nothing else, understand that the bureaucracy is an ally that's there to support you. Thank you, John. Those claps were coming from councillors too. Sharon Ellis over there, sit down. You know, um, my mayor and I were discussing this very topic on the way down and uh, this issue of first-time councillors and how ill-prepared they are, in, some, in many cases, in fact, and what, a, what an effect, often negative, they can have on what was a reasonably functional council. And we'll discuss, and, and Councillor Kurnow was discussing this notion of compulsory education. And uh, 
I'm hearing that a bit today, and I've been hearing it a bit in recent times, for those who are doing the review of the electoral system. Uh, but why doesn't this happen in state parliament? And the reality is, in what's the minimum number of council laws is five, and the maximum is 12 in Victoria, I think. Yep, that's right. Uh, at any one election, you could have a significant uh, insertion of new councillors into the team. You generally don't get that at state or federal level. The ability of uh, a bunch of new state parliamentarians to completely upset the apple cart is much reduced because they are a handful in a much bigger seat. In local government, a council can be tipped on its ear. Uh, and, yeah, I, th I think there is a role to address this. Gary, can I come? Yes. Uh, probably one of the things we haven't said about uh, the, is education after one becomes a council. We've spoken a lot about education before one, whereas one's had it really, but although I agree with Mark absolutely that uh, newly elected councillors need <coughs> to treat the administration as their allies, because that helps build the trust and helps to give rise to the sort of collaboration that I think we've all spoken about today. It's important that councillors be skilled up. It's important that they be able to read financial statements. Mm. It's important that they understand the planning system and the limitations associated with decision making. And my feeling is that although there are obviously professional development opportunities that are afforded to uh, councillors, and I'm very conscious that being a councillor isn't a full-time job for, for most, but my feeling is there just aren't enough opportunities out there, there isn't a systematic enough program for educated councillors and skilling them up. Because I think the administration, almost without exception, will actually um, favour councillors to challenge them about things. They don't just sit there and you know, accept that the report is right, but will ask questions about it. And the questions are going to be more telling if they've had education about various aspects of council operations. So, I think one of the things that needs to be looked at is a more systematic uh, program of professional development and education once one becomes a council. Um, Mark, interestingly, um, I've seen and have heard other councillors talk about those who need to be here or not. And I refer to councillor development weekends where you, you just get this amazing willingness, particularly in those early years where people are coming along wanting to learn get involved and invariably there'll be a tale about well, so and so needs to be here but they've been on council for 20 years and they think they know everything and they're not here. Um, so it, one of the best ways that I've uh, you know, enjoyed work is working with the council as a whole and in their location at a time that they're all in there. There's got to be a combination of them. Um, Mark, I just want to say, you know, if you were feeling a bit wounded before, I've always still well of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just want to take up uh, Michael's comment before. He talked about culture, and certainly culture sets the tone for an organisation. But also, part of that is effective leadership, both at the administration level through the CEO, and also at the political level with the mayor. Now, when the two align, and share power together, I think that's when you've got a great council serving the community. But in my experience, uh, where I've seen that we fall down is at the political level, that I believe there's not enough done in developing leadership at that level. Just uh, would like a comment on that, and if we're not doing enough, what more can we do? Organisational discord, um it occurs to a greater and lesser uh, degree, regardless of the organisation or the institution that one may be a part of. Um, uh, at times, the tension can be creative. Uh, the worry, of course, and I think that this is what's, what's being alluded to, is when the tension becomes destructive. Uh, I've been in a situation where uh, I've watched that tension uh, almost pull a council apart and really it's, it's incumbent upon the Mayor in taking up that leadership role to be prepared to, uh, I'd say in concert with the, uh, the CEO uh, to look at uh, external support and that's what 
Uh, in my experience, that's what we had to do. We actually asked the, the MAV to come in and uh, explore the issues in confidence um, and to try and adjudicate on the matter to, to take the heat out of the occasion. Otherwise, uh, no problem. And I think what Mark Hayes spoke about earlier, you know, the, where the behaviour becomes so aberrant that it, it becomes uh, a boundary violation. You, uh, you start to become abusive in the chamber. Uh, you start to undertake activities as, as we've uh, seen in other places where you know, listening devices. Um, that's, I've got to say, that's bizarre. That's cloak and dagger to me. But hopefully before one gets to that point, uh, ideally with the Mayor and uh, hopefully with the Council working together to, to bring in an external agency. Uh, not to say that that's the silver bullet, but that's a way to go, not necessarily the way to go. Um, Tony, I'd like to add that there could be some other ways of looking at things. Um, I would love to see almost a pool of mentors. When a um, mayor gets elected, it's a fairly lonely role, particularly if they're juggling a very tight council. And it, some, for some people, leadership is there. They've had lots of time to develop their leadership skills. For others, they're thrust into it, or they think they can do it and don't understand the challenges when they get there. It becomes lonely because they don't want to go and talk to the CEO um, if there's another dynamic going on, and they can't necessarily talk to their pool of counsellors to say, I'm, I'm stuck here, I don't know how to make a decision. It'd be great to have a pool of mentors who can walk alongside, not make decisions on that person's behalf, but actually be there walking alongside them and helping them with that role. It's a non-judgmental role and it's a walking wheel. There's the other thing about you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink. There's a lot of uh, good training that is around. There is certainly good leadership training that I believe exists. But there, are, as I said before, there are many people who don't have the, um, the open-mindedness to know that they're the ones that are actually in trouble, that they need the particular support. There are others, as Kate's just demonstrated, it, who are just sponges, who are so willing to learn and grow and be the best they can be in the role. So I'd, I'd like to think that we can think a little bit differently and have a multi-pronged approach. Mm. Gavin, I'd just say that despite those things that Michael and Susan have spoken about, it seems to me a council is going to go through a cycle at times where there's a political vacuum and there's a leadership vacuum. Mm. We've all seen various councils, the weak mayor, who, whether by dint of their personality or the politics around them, just isn't capable of being an effective leader. And I think all you can do during those periods is write it out as best you can, then the cycle presumably will return. But I think you'll be living in utopia if you think that through you know, mentoring or through the greater um, tendency of leadership courses, that it's going to deliver effective political leadership 100% of the time in all councils as it won't. Thank you. Uh, Jill Jocelyn, first time councillor at North Dura Rural City Council. And uh, I worked for council for nearly 20 years before I was elected last year. And the staff are giving me a really hard time because I reckon I'll go over to the dark side. <laughs> um, I'm having the time of my life and I love being a councillor and I'm enjoying all the challenges. But you don't realise what you don't know until you get there. I know a lot about operational matters at council, but I'm learning something new every day. And thank you to the MAV for running all these things because I've been telling everyone this year. And um, my brain hurts sometimes, but I'm just soaking it up and I'm loving it. But do you think anyone on the panel, um, or all of you if you want to, that some training should be mandatory? I mean, we all do induction, but I don't think that's enough. And I wondered what you thought about some mandatory training for new councillors. Thanks. Does anyone from the, the panel wish to comment on that? Just how you found the transition from citizen to councillor, what things you need to be assisted with, all that sort of stuff. Gav, uh, is it, I don't mind saying, I think that every councillor must be able to read a balance sheet. If you can't read a balance sheet, you're in a lot of trouble, believe me. Uh, and you've got to really uh, talk the talk when it comes to understanding <laughs> 
uh, the, the financial dimensions to the organisation. And, and taking on board what was said about uh, uh, the council that is prepared to challenge uh, the, the, the bureaucracy around the detail. You know, you, you've got to be able to look at that balance sheet and understand where your costs are, where your liabilities might be, and understand where the risks to the organisation might be. So, at very least, uh, finance. The other side is legal. Very, very clear. Law of tort, tort of negligence, that would be one. And then uh, from there, just understanding uh, the, the minefield from a legal perspective of what a councillor can get themselves into in the event that they enter provinces that are not theirs to enter, in the event that they get into uh, procurement processes and seek to influence those processes, being very clear right before they, that they start what the penalties might be in the event that they engage in such processes. So, and I'd, I'd leave the detail to, to someone like, like Mark Hayes and, and those beige people who come after him. Um, yeah, but the, if nothing else from where I sit, those two areas and uh, everything else I think you can, you can pick up on the run. Thank you. John? Uh, mandatory training, Gavin, I'm, I'm not sure, Jocelyn, uh, if it's mandatory. It's this thing about if you don't pay for it, you don't value it. You've got to want to do the training. Uh, and the other comment I'd make is I think timing is important. I'm not sure when the right time is. Actually, the right time is probably before a new councillor is elected, but that won't be necessarily on their radar. There is that much going on in the first 12 months of a newly elected councillor's term. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's probably term, uh, year two of a term is the time for training. Uh, and the other one I would add to, uh, to Michael's recipe list is how the planning system works. Yeah, because, planning for, system works. because for seasoned councillors, it's still a mystery. It's actually a mystery for CEOs at times, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mystery to us all, John. We've talked about um, knowledge and skills and doing extra training for people who are not able to do it. I'm a second um, term councillor and first time mayor. And what I've noticed with a lot of um, new councillors that have come on board, and plus I'm on the mayor uh, advisory panel for the local government, so what we're saying about um, um, making is happening sort of in what we're talk, discussing about at that level. But my question is, I'm having a lot of um, concerns with um, new councillors' trust. They don't trust the CEO, they don't trust the directors, they don't trust the engineer reports, they don't, but they're, they've got nothing to base it on. And, and I'd just be interested, how do you get them to understand that? Like they're newly on and you've got other councils that have been there before and if you don't have the respect and don't have the trust behind these, how can you make some um, pretty serious decisions and vote? Indeed, mm -hmm. Russ, how's that built, how's it engendered? And how is it uh, carried out? Well, it's really built at the beginning um, of the council cycle through collaborative processes between councillors, newly elected, experienced on the one hand, and council staff on the other. So that's the way it's built. I have seen places I have done inductions where councillors have, in a sense, written the power uh, because of a platform that is all about distrusting the administration. And so it is very difficult in some places for that to work, and all the administration can do is keep plugging away and proving that they're there to serve the community and they're honest and are trying to pull the wool over council's eyes. For most, in my experience, they sort of come on board slowly and there's more and more trust seated. For some, unfortunately, they never get past it, and there's not much you can do about mm. those things. And I think it just echoes my commentary before that particularly in the last election I saw so much more of this cynicism that was really about we fundamentally distrust local government and then people were elected on that platform so they came in very angry thinking they had a mandate to rip apart something that was broken. Um, that, so it goes a fair way back and that goes back to these community relationships so there's there has to be that sort of relationship continually being maintained and built on trust 
so that people don't come in um, suspicious to start with. Once they are in, then it is that really, we call it deposits into the emotional trust account, which is really about that transparency, that openness, the willingness to try and take the heat out and open up and say, you know, here's what the information is, what is it that we can work on together? How can we continue to, to build this trust? And it's every action counts in that um, building up the trust. It is something that, for those who've been through the top teams programs and working together to deliver programs, that, that's the fundamental aspect of it, is how do we have conversations that we would not normally have that will help us get to understand each other better and get that suspicion and the cynicism out of there. Julie? Um, whilst I haven't experienced what you were talking about, and I'm an officer, but what I do see at Golden Plains is a, uh, a probably something that I'm not sure happens very many places, but following a council meeting, we actually have a council dinner, and I've seen that be a, an interesting place. So the councillors stay, the uh, senior management stays, the CEO and the senior management, and we invite from time to time people that we would want to influence, so they might be politicians or state government bureaucrats, and we also invite council staff. So at every council, after every council meeting, there is a dinner and there are staff officers who are probably new to local government, new to Golden Plains. And I've seen that work well. And I think that from what I hear, the history of Golden Plains is that that's been something that has broken down some of those, the, 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 the tensions. It's means that the council meeting is very formal. Once the council meeting finishes, there's a different set of relationships, and I think that's possibly helped. Thank you. Jill Chan? Um, fundamentally, if there's no trust, then it's very difficult to develop any sort of relationship with a councillor. I've been very lucky. We've had two fantastic councillors over the uh, ten years that we've been going. Therefore, there's nothing like having that I guess emotional support from a guy, and they've both been men counsellors, not women can't do it, they good a job. But they've both been guys that have been prepared to listen and guide. And that's, you know, we've had really, really good advice from those guys. One's a very seasoned one, one's only a new one. We, we actually tell him we're breaking him in. But once again, that element of of, I believe you, you're here to help us and we're here to work very well with you, um, is something we've been fortunate to experience. Jen, you say you trust your councillors? Mm -hmm. Me? Yep. The ones I deal with, I do. Yep. 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 <laughs> <laughs> John. Hey, Jan. Uh, <laughs> Lisa, I, I think... Actually, trust is the currency on which we trade as officers in our relationship with our council. Uh, hard to get, although a certain amount is owed, but very easily lost, and once lost, extraordinarily hard to recover. In relation to the question that you posed, what's the, how do you deal with it when you have a couple of either new councillors or just a couple of councillors who distrust their officers, distrust the advice that they're being provided? If the remainder of the council doesn't hold that view, I think that the remainder of the council has a role in, in bringing those two councillors along by, by questioning their, their, uh, their attitudes towards the staff. Because if there's a lack of trust and there's no basis for it, clearly they're biased in some way or another. Um, I've certainly experienced it some years ago uh, where that was the case with a particular councillor I had in a council I was working at at the time, and his fellow councillors actually called him to order on Tom's and they thought, there is no basis for those allegations you're making. Why are you asking that question, Read, Haven't you read the report? And actually pulled this councillor into line. It wasn't pretty, but it was effective. Thank you, John. Michael, you look like a trustworthy sort of councillor. Trust me, friend. <laughs> uh, Lisa, uh, this for me is, again, sentinel. To try and manage the mad, the bad, and the dangerous councillor 
is one of the greatest challenges, I think, to everybody in this room. And what I say is the best of British luck to the lot of you. <laughs> what do you do with someone who operates in a world of fantasy and, seriously, delusion, who truly believes in its... And I had this, I had this. It's a Murdoch press conspiracy. <laughs> Hold on. And this, uh, can I take just a, yes, a moment here? Yes, we had this mob. I'm not, sorry. We had this community group called Solar West. Evidently, they'd been operating at our pool for 25 years having these nude swimming programs. Now, this is great, uh, but I, I, I never got an invite. <laughs> not one. Anyway, there was a real... It, like, this came up as an issue, and, you know, you talk to the community, who this is the first time they found out about it, and really the community was saying, hold on, they can do it at their place, in, at their pool, but we don't want it in our pool, thanks very much. And, you know, I talked to a, a lot of people... And it was really clear that this is this is what was going on. You know, people did not want this group to be there, and all the other councillors, bar one, bar one, was understanding that you know this this was a real issue because there was, and it, it was in the press, uh, a, a question of pedo pedophilia. There was the, the the couple from Frankston that you perhaps remember a couple of years ago. They, they were running around the state. They were wound up being picked up. Well, they were part of this Solar West group. And to try and say to this councillor, councillor, these two people who are being, you know, questioned and were later charged over these pedophilia allegations, they're in cahoots with these other people who are also being questioned about all of this. Uh, how about we just sort of let this go away? And that's when it came out. Nah, nah. That, that they do this in Europe all the time. I'm thinking, what? Interfere with little children? I don't think so. Um, and then it came out, well, it's a, I, this is another example of the Murdoch press conspiracy. I thought, mate, you know, you, this guy was going to be mayor <laughs> until this particular point. It, it, there are issues that come, that, that come up that really can demonstrate where a person might be coming from. You know, that the logic, reason and rational thought for some isn't there, quite simply. And it doesn't matter what you say or what you do, at the end of the day, someone, and they, they, can, get, they can get voted on council, can be slightly disturbed and never, ever, ever deny the fact that someone might be there who is either mad, bad, or dangerous. Okay. It's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to just make a quick statement if I could. As a second term councillor, it's been interesting to hear comments in relation to the calibre of people that stood for election and in some cases have been elected. I have a personal view that I think some of our representative bodies bear a lot of responsibility for this. In the lead up to the last election, there was a huge campaign from all sorts of groups urging more people from a whole diverse range to stand for council. No one offered any real training or uh, support for those people, but shake the tree and the monkeys do fall. So that was perhaps the comment, and I think we all bear a degree of responsibility for that. My second part of it is to, to John, and um, we're keeping our CEO, but if he ever fell off the perch in the near future, we know where to find you. Once your councillors have spoken to somebody about their badly graded road, or their pothole, or their uh, sudden rate increase, or the lack of fire breaks, or whatever, what do you expect the councillors then to do? John? I think in most organisations, uh, but in the council I currently work in, it's very clear. Uh, the councillor brings those issues to the CEO. Uh, we've put that in place specifically so that... Uh, well, I'll go back a step. Is the pothole in Smith Road any more important than the, smot than the pothole in Jones Road? Well, if the pothole in Smith Road was reported to the councillor, the councillor's got some interest in that being fixed because it goes to his reputation in the community or her reputation in the community about how effective they are as a councillor. Because as I was saying at my opening address, that 
in the end of the day is probably how you're judged, not on how good a strategist you are. So I get that, and my staff get that, and certainly my council get that. So those complaints come always come through the CEO so that I get the chance to make sure they are addressed in accordance with proper process and don't fall through the cracks. So those requests go through our administration, they get inspected, assessed and then responded to. And what should happen is that you, the councillor, are then contacted by us and told what, our, what the outcome is and what we've done about it. And we would then ask you, councillor, do you want us to respond to the uh, constituent that raised the matter with you or would you like to do that yourself? Confession time here, folks. We actually don't do that last step all the time all that well and all our good work is undone because we didn't close the loop right at the end. We work on it and we work on it and we work on it. But the people who do that doing, they're focused on outcomes. They're not focused on people. They're actually technical st mm. brains and they're not focused on the needs of their, their people all the time and they forget to make that phone call. Thank you, John. Michael Clark, John McClendon, Jan, Jill, Susan, Mark, thank you all for your time. Really <laughs>